Welcome back to Diesel Talk. My name is Tony Salas. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, the topic for today of Diesel Talk is uh, we're going to look at some of the earlier stuff on Duramax Diesel, 6.6 liter. We do get from time to time uh, technicians asking us questions. And yes, I have people asking me questions. In this case, on the LB7 LLY LBZ LMM, which is the Bosch Common Rail Injection. So I thought we'd talk about a little bit about the common rail basics of uh, what's a, what you find in Duramax diesel. So let's get going here. Let's go get going here. So fuel system features, well, what do we got? Well, first of all, believe it or not, the Duramax application since its birth back in 2001 with the LB7, moving on to the LLY, to the LBZ, which coexisted with the LLY. And then we had the LMM all the way to about 2010 model year. Um, you have to understand those, <laughs> excuse me, those models all the way to, um, you know, actually the LM and LML too. Yep. Those actually have a no lip pump. So the, the there's no lip pump here at all. So I guess the main thing we got to understand is, yeah, there's no lip pump. If you look at Cummins 5.9, Cummins 6.7, you look at power stroke families, they have lip pumps or, you know, fuel pumps. And in this case, the Duramax from the factory did not have a lift pump. So one thing you got to remember is that we are sucking the fuel out of the tank per se. So somewhere in that engine valley on a Duramax application, 6.6 .6 liter, we find uh, pretty much the CP3 injection pump. And that injection pump is sucking the fuel. So please note the gas cap. That's what I'm trying to start out here is the gas cap. The gas cap, as you can see, has um, kind of a unique design. It has a a vacuum valve, if you will, that actually vents the tank at about one inch. So if there's enough suction on that tank where we pull on it and create a negative pressure in that tank, what's going to happen is that it's going to collapse the wall. So what we put in a gas cap for the Duramax applications is some form of relief or excessive vacuum, which in this case is no more than one inch, as you can see here, and also a pressure. So if we build too much pressure in the tank, and in this case, what's going to happen is that at 2 PSI, it's going to relieve the pressure. So one thing is to relieve a positive pressure of above 2 PSI. Another thing is to relieve a negative pressure, which is a vacuum, and in this case, under an inch. So let's keep that in mind as I end this real quickly. So as you know, there is a primer pump on the Duramax applications, and you're going to find that primer pump is what we prime the system up once we replace the fuel filter. So in this case, we prime it, and at that point, you know, we try to get this truck started. Many of you may have, have had issues with Duramax applications where the truck will all of a sudden just won't restart after a you know, long drive or maybe just sitting overnight. In many cases, the culprit has been this guy right here in the picture, which is the uh, pretty much the pump on top of the fuel filter housing. The one sad thing that many will say about the uh, Duramax applications is that we're only using one filter. If you compare that with power strokes, those use how many? Two. Cummins has one too, but now on the newer ones, actually not too new anymore, you know, above 2016, we have two filters too as well. So in this case, that's the primer pump. But what I want to tell you is that you actually should be holding a good vacuum in there. But at the same time, you're also got suction going there. So it is a vacuum. It's a negative pressure. So one of the things you got to keep in mind is um, a quick test. If you ever want to do this, uh, you're going to have to go to your local. If you don't, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, you got to have a hand primer pump, one of those hand pumps. And in this case, one of the things to test it, so what we want to do is, put a vacuum here. So I would disconnect disconnect the hose on the outlet line. This is the outlet line right there. And this is the suction line coming into the filter. So this is in and this is out right here. You'll see arrows on some models pointing in, pointing out. Now, what you're gonna do is just simply with the engine off, obviously you disconnect the hose, you adapt the vacuum pump and you just hand pump, you know, just pump it up. And in this case, what you're looking for it is to hold vacuum. So if you wanna take the 10 inches, 12 inches, see if it holds. If it doesn't hold, then definitely your housing is leaking. Now, in the past, there were, you know, Alliant Power and uh, other companies were selling kits to rebuild these puppies. And believe it or not, many of us are no longer rebuilding them. Like us, we don't rebuild them anymore. We can buy the whole housing with a filter for somewhere around 120 and 30 bucks. Obviously, prices may change in your area, but we rather just replace the whole unit, especially if the vehicle's old, let's say a 2005. You know, that's pretty old. So in this case, we're replaced, but it is rebuildable. So, so once again, what did I say? Duramax 6.6 .6 liters, uh, they actually do not use a lip pump from the factory. So therefore they suck the fuel in. 
Therefore, this coming into the filter, this line coming out of the filter towards the injection pump, in this case is actually in a suction. So that's a negative pressure. So we're sucking the fuel from the tank. So sealing is very important. So we got to make sure all the clamps are tight, make sure the hoses aren't corroded away. Very important to check. So on your later models, you know, you're going to find like when we move to the LML, LML models, you're going to find that there is a, a fuel filter vacuum switch. So if there is excessive vacuum, very high vacuum, it's going to trigger light because we've got a restriction somewhere. Something is causing too much suck to occur. So there might be a restriction, which most likely is the fuel filter. Keep that in mind. So there's a CP3 pump that they used on these models all the way up to the LMM. The LML models, which are 2011 later Duramax, those use the, what, the CP4 pump? So in this case, they use the CP4, but many people love the CP3, which is a good pump. But in this case, this pump is inserted in there and it goes in the engine valley. But one thing we got to keep in mind is when you replace the CP3 pump, a, is it always bad? And two, what are the quality of the hoses going to it? So take a look at those hoses. If you are doing replacement, you want to make sure that those hoses don't have any kinks, cracks, or just old because they could be coming apart. There's the better view of the CP3 pump. But one thing I want to let you know on the CP3 pump is that there are three plungers. Okay, the CP4 has two. So for those of you that want to retrofit, uh, get rid of the CP4 because you heard all these stories. It's got its weakness, okay? And I'll briefly mention it, but I'll make another presentation later on of the CP4. But three plungers, okay? So when this eccentric cam moves in as, it, as the actual gear makes it move, what's going to happen is you're going to have three strokes per revolution. The CP4 has two plungers, but has two cams per revolution. So therefore, the CP3 displaces three plungers, while the CP4 displaces two plungers twice in one revolution. So therefore, it displaces four times. Again, three here for the CP3. CP4 has two plungers, but has two cams. So therefore, every 180 degrees, it sees a cam. So therefore, it displaces how many times those plungers? Four. In other words, the CP4 out displaces the CP3. Not to mention the pressures that it was designed to work with are not the same. I mean, 29,000 PSI for CP4 is no biggie, but on a CP3, it wasn't good. So something to keep in mind. There, I'm done with that CP4 thing. But in this case, you're going to see also a, uh, a pretty much a gear-driven pump. That is a low-pressure suction pump. That is your, your pump, your lip pump. But in this case, it's located on the back of the CP3 pump, and that's the guy that's sucking the fuel from the engine valley through the filter, through the lines, all the way back to the tank. So it's quite a travel of negative pressure we're pulling in to suck that fuel in. So again, that is something to be, keep in mind that we cannot have any leaks or aerate the system because we're going to have a problem. And what was the culprit I told you got to watch out for? This guy right here, right? So in this case, it could be the, that's the number one cause we see most of the time, but not the only thing, but that's the one cause. So what are you going to do? You're going to go ahead and put a suction pump right here, excuse me, vacuum pump here with it disconnected, pump it up and see if it holds vacuum. If it don't hold vacuum, then therefore this is leaking. It needs to be rebuilt or it needs to be replaced. So one or two, make your choice, whatever you want to do. So we have an M-Prop. There's many damn names for the same thing, depending on the manufacturer we're talking about. Uh, GM likes to call it fuel rail pressure regulator. This is the guy that meters, again, the lift pump fuel, excuse me, the lifted fuel or the suction fuel that goes into the plungers, those three plungers we just saw. So he's actually metering and controlling it. So the computer is pulse width modulating or turning on and off this valve right here to again control from the supply of the fuel coming from the tank and going to the high pressure plungers we just saw. So if you're lost, what are the plungers? Is these three guys right here that generate the high rail pressure we need. Please note, the CP3 pump is a high pressure generator. It's not really ever been a high volume. It's mostly high pressure because it's designed to go from, you know, if you ever look at the truck, you ever looked at desired versus actual rail pressure, you're going to see at idle, we might see 4,200, 3,000, but yet it could go all the way up to about 23, 24,000 on these model trucks. So in this case, who does that is the fuel rail pressure regular, which is this guy right here that you find on the injection pump itself. But like I said, the CP4 pump, is generating, which is, I thought I'd show you a picture. This pump is actually timed or phased in, as they say. But in this case, this guy can generate 29,000 PSI. So 
it goes in the same place as CP3, but in this case, you know, you got to understand that it generates more. So should you be retrofitting in a, uh, a CP3 and a CP4? No, you shouldn't. It's stupid because you got to understand. And when people bitch at me about the CP4, let me get one thing clear. OK, they will say, well, you know, it blows up because they read too much on the Internet and everything in the Internet's true. Right. But here's the deal. If you look at this designs of both pumps, please understand, like I said already, one displaces the other. Correct. All right. The other thing you got to keep in mind is the fact that, you know, we, we have dealt with problems like this in the past with fuel systems and people get all bent out of shape because it costs a lot of money. I understand that. But back in 99. For example, we had the Cummins 5.9 with the VP44 injection pump, VP44 injection pump. What was taking out that VP44 injection pump was low lip pump pressure and air, right? Not enough fuel coming in there. Same thing with the CP4 pump. What takes out a CP4 pump is, one, is not enough fuel pressure, lip pump pressure, lip pump pressure, and also air. When does this usually happen is when you service the truck. So in this case, you got to make sure after you replaced the fuel filters on your CP4 equipped Duramax or Power Stroke, whatever you're dealing with, you got to make sure you let them idle for at least 50 minutes to cover your butt to make sure it works out all the air. Because under load, when you go take off with it, put some RPM, is when you can grenade the pump or start taking out the pump. So there you go. Now, to finish up here, here's the deal. <clears throat> when we look at an LB7, this is an LB7 right here. We got a tank. We got a fuel injection control module all the way to 2005. We quit using it in 06. Anyways, we see there's that filter right there, and then we got our CP3 injection pump, and then we go to a junction block, and then eventually to the fuel rails. Here's what I'm trying to get at, is understanding the system, how it basically works. We're sucking fuel from the tank, and this is all the suction. So when you connect your gauge, there's a test port, and you're going to measure the suction, which should not exceed no more than four inches under idle. Idle. So in this case, if I see five inches, that means most likely my fuel filter is restricted. But what General Motors now talks about, and they've been talking about it for a while on the service information, is they want you to do a suction test under load. They're saying under a full load, and you can drive the truck with the gauge right there on your windshield or hanging off the mirror. you got to get a long enough gauge. And in this case, you're going to go ahead and supposed to not see no more than 10 inches. I disagree. I've seen rail pressure problems as low as eight inches under load. So if I see eight, uh, it's a red flag for me. Something's restricting, which could be the fuel filter. Hell, it could be the, the pickup filter that's inside the tank. Regardless, though, we need to test this low pressure suction. Why am I saying that? There are three departments to common rail. There is a suction side, low pressure side. There's your high pressure side, which goes to the injectors. And then after the injectors, we have a low pressure side. So if I follow this low pressure right here, you're going to see it goes to a fuel cooler. And in this case, the fuel cooler goes back to the fuel tank. So the question begs, why did they put a fuel cooler on these trucks on the return side? So you'll see it in front of the fuel tank if you've never seen one. It's right in front of the fuel tank. So in this case, make sure it's clean because it needs to have airflow going across it to cool the fuel. But why are we cooling the fuel going back to the tank? Well, the reason why we cool the fuel behind the tank is because this is all return fuel. So some of this high pressure that was released from the injector going back to the fuel cooler is actually maybe at a high pressure. So the problem is, what's, depending on the heat, depending what's going on with ambient temperature, we can have some fuel that's turned into a gas. In other words, it changed state. It's not in a liquid anymore. It might be in a, a vapor form. So remember, we looked at the gas cap at the beginning. Okay. So the gas cap at the beginning, what I'm trying to say is we can have some vapor coming in here, but we're not supposed to have because guess who's cooling it down? So when we got this in a vapor gas and we cool it down, it turns back into a liquid. In reality, it shouldn't be called a fuel cooler. It should be called, called a fuel condenser. That's what we're looking for here. So a fuel condenser works very well. So in this case, it condensed fuel, so make sure we don't get too much pressure. But in the event, there might be mud and crap, and it might be a warm day, and there might get, be some vapor going back to the tank. What's going to happen to the tank? It's going to pressurize the tank. 
Okay, so in this case, it's going to pressurize the tank. And at that point, that's where that two PSI cap needs to come in to blow off that excess pressure so we don't get a lot of vapor in there. And if we do have vapor in there, we got bubbles in there, what's going to happen is we're going to suck it back in. Hopefully, it'll condense itself. But if not, it could actually go back into injection pump, which is very highly unlikely. But if the conditions are right, it can't happen. So what also can happen? Well, if you notice on the cap at the beginning again, we saw that it actually relieves pressure at one inch. So in this case, you're going to find that if we're sucking in, we got to make sure that, you know, if we're running low on fuel, we're going to create more of a, of a vacuum buildup and low pressure built up inside the tank. So therefore, we must also be able to relieve it. So it isn't surprising to look underneath many trucks, not just the Duramaxes, where we see that the fuel tank is what? Collapsed. What has collapsed it down is because it never vented. So the moral of the story here is make sure that you actually use the correct cap on a Duramax application. So in this case, you don't use because I see that if you order a cap, the best one to buy is from a dealership. But look, why? Excuse me. Watch out what you're buying from the local auto parts. So make sure it's got the correct cap on it. So something to keep in mind. Now usually I'll stop there, but I'll go one more thing here. Always remember something. If you, for those of you that are novices at this, if you have a low rail pressure code, right? If you got low rail pressure. This is a basic one-on-one here of common rail. Here you could see a later model LLY where they got rid of the FICM. You can see there's no more FICM here, fuel injection control module. But here's the deal. If you're sucking fuel here on the low pressure side, which you should check all the time, again, no more than how many inches at idle? Four, okay? Now, at that point, you're looking at the high pressure side. Now, if you have a low rail pressure code, What's going to happen? There's that PO87, PO89, right? So in this case, um, what a lot of people that are novices say, oh, I got low rail pressure. So in this case, what's the first thing they're going to replace? The injection pump. That's a big no-no, okay? In order to create pressure, you got to push against something. So if you're not pushing against anything, you're not going to generate any pressure. So who are we pushing up against? Well, it goes through the rails. These are the rails, by the way. And finally, to the injectors. So in this case, if those injectors have excessive return, that means they're going to relieve that pressure back to the tank. So in other words, you got to leak check the system, or you can do a, a return volume test to see if one of these injectors has a leak. So on early model Bosch Common Rail, just a quick note, you'll notice that here we can see the high pressure coming into the injector. This is ball. This is the ball and seat injector, which has been giving us problem, but it's still out there, still being used. And in this case, the uh, please note that the LMM Duramax is in later, which is 2011, 2010 and a half, 2011, and later use a piezo common rail. But here, it's the ball and seat, which Cummins is still continuing to use under 5.9s and 6.7s. So in this case, fuel comes in. We see fuel coming into the bottom here, right? So it works on a on a concept of pressure equalization. So let me go ahead and highlight this. So what, where, where am I leaking when I get high rail pressure coming in? Well, it goes in here. It goes and deadheads against the hollow ball. So that hollow ball is a key there because this plunger right here is going to go ahead and be energized by the computer. So what's going to happen is that when it's energized by the computer, it's going to go ahead and unseat the ball, allow the ball to unseat, and go towards the return right there. Make sense? So with that said, what I'm just trying to show you is what is leaking within the injector is that ball and seat assembly right there. Okay. Let me erase some of this so you'll see it better. So make sense? So hopefully some of you are getting it, but <clears throat> so that we'll get more into in a separate presentation on this. But what I'm just trying to say is that this ball and seat right there, let me get rid of this. Uh, once again, can be leaking. So one of the things we got to keep in mind is we got to do a leak check on the injector or do a return volume test on that injector. So what means that if it's an LLY or later model is we're going to go ahead and let me highlight this again. Let me get to my laser pointer. And in this case, what we're going to do is on the injector itself, you're going to find that there is a return line. So in many cases, we can disconnect the returns and check to see if we have excessive return there flow there so but we'll get that later and get into that later with um, high pressure diesel talk but for now what was the subject of the day was to tell you about you know the basics of common rail but also understand that why is that fuel cap very important on a duramax application because it allows the relieving 
of excess pressure built up in the tank and also the excess negative pressure so it doesn't collapse, you know? So let's keep that in mind. All right, so with that, hopefully you learned a little bit today and uh, check those low pressure systems. Do not test any high pressure common rail system unless you check the low pressure system. So on a Duramax, we just learned there is no lift pump, right? Now the Savannah Express models, let's be clear, do have a lift pump which is the Savannah Express vans. Those use a lift pump, but that's a different operation. But the trucks, the Kodiak, the, all the different trucks, those actually that are Duramax equipped do not have a lift pump. Now, food for thought though, can you add an aftermarket pump on it? Yes, you can. There's many companies that sell a lift pump where you can put it in. So, But for a stock truck that you're not messing with, you're just running, just understand there is a suction built up on the low pressure side, but you cannot diagnose any high pressure issues, maybe a no start issue or whatever, until you check that suction side. But you're gonna affect greatly the suction side if you don't have the correct cap on the fuel, on the fuel tank. So, and one more thing, I'm trying to let you go here, but one more thing. We've had customers in the past complain about, hey, Tony, every time I go fill up the truck, as soon as I leave, you know, I take off, it might actually hesitate or buck a little bit, but then it'll run fine. Well, think about this. If you go to a fuel station, especially those of you that fill up at truck stops, you know, you got those high volume pumps. What are you doing to the fuel when you're actually fueling up? And if you're keeping the truck running, which many of you do, you keep the truck running, what are you doing? You're aerating it. The fuel's aerated. So some of those air bubbles are going into the system. And eventually what's gonna happen when you take off that air bubble might work its way through and eventually gets spit out of the injector and that's where you get your hesitation. But once the aeration works itself up to the top of the tank, there's no more air being sucked in, then therefore you're not gonna have a problem. So food for thought. A, don't keep clicking on the pump when you're feeling, that's gonna aerate more than what you're supposed to. And two is, it's a good idea to shut off the truck while you're feeling so to prevent that from happening. So. My name is Tony Sells. I hope you learned something today and we will see you again next time here on Diesel Talk. Thanks for watching.